Brennan Othman makes his highly anticipated Ranger debut. We discuss the Rangers' 4-1 to win over the Blackhawks and explain why Othman needs to stay in New York. You're locked on the New York Rangers, your daily podcast on the New York Rangers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back, Blue Shirts fans, to episode number 976 of the Locked On New York Rangers podcast. I'm your host, John Chick. just want to thank you guys, as always, for making Locked On New York Rangers your first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms, including YouTube. And today's episode of Locked On New York Rangers is brought to you by Sleeper. Download the Sleeper app and use promo code LOCKEDONNHL to get up to a $100 match on your first deposit. Terms and conditions apply. See Sleeper's terms of use for details. And we are, of course, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. And obviously a really nice win for the Rangers last night, uh, Thursday night. Uh, a game that was highlighted by, of course, the highly anticipated debut of rookie Brent Offman. He makes his NHL debut for the Rangers at the age of 21. Just kind of the latest in a long list of recent Ranger prospects over the past few years that have uh, made their debut at a very tender age. And uh, Brent Offman now kind of joining the group here. But uh, for anybody that needs a quick recap of Brent Offman, Former first-round pick, went number 16 overall back in 2021. Uh, played this year with the Wolfpack for 28 games. Had nine goals and 14 assists and is a minus six with Hartford. It's kind of been up and down, at least in terms of uh, his scoring at Hartford. It seems like he's a little bit streaky there. And uh, somebody actually mentioned on Twitter that he had gone through a little bit of a scoring drought before this call-up. I believe nine games without a goal is, is what they said about often. But regardless, uh, he's still shown very well for himself there and uh, now getting rewarded with the promotion to the New York Rangers. And it's possible that he might not go anywhere for a while. You know, we'll talk about that. Technically, he's an emergency loan right now, but, um, you know, the, the options are open as far as what the Rangers can do uh, with Brian Hoffman going forward. And, of course, he got the call up after Tyler Pitlick was injured, and it sounds like Pitlick, uh, as of right now, going to be week to week. I also, you know, we're going to get into Hoffman's performance here in just a second, but I also want to talk a little bit about uh, his OHL numbers. We talked about this in the past, you know, really ever since the Rangers drafted him, and uh, he went to the OHL and basically just killed it. The one year with Flint, and this is two years ago, 66 games there in the OHL, Flint Firebirds, 50 goals and 47 assists. And he also split last year between Flint and Peterborough and was well over a point per game uh, during that split season as well. So Brian Hoffman just continues to uh, put up numbers no matter where he plays. And as we mentioned, he's now in the Ranger lineup in place of Tyler Pitlick. And the lineup was kind of a... Uh, Hot button topic, probably for the first time really all season. I think for the most part, Ranger fans have been pretty happy about the line combinations this season. It really started on opening night when LaViolette had all three of the uh, members of the former kid line, Kako, Lafreniere, and Hedl, all in the top six. I think that kind of got him off to a good start as far as Ranger fans are concerned in the eyes of Ranger fans. But this one created a little bit more debate. You get a top line left to right of Kreider, Mika, and Wheeler. Uh, the second line, of course, Panarin, Trocek, and Lafreniere. So the top six completely unchanged. But then you got a third line left to right of Othman, Bonino, and Brodzinski. And then the fourth line, Cooley, Goodrow, and Vizi. And a lot to unpack here. As far as what the reason for this might be, and I was hoping that Othman would be in the top nine, and indeed he was. I was kind of hoping that him and Cooley might be out there on the third line together. Uh, Othman could play right wing, Cooley could play left wing. But when you look at this logically... Uh, they wanted to get Offman into the top nine, which they did that uh, with this lineup. The only thing that I wasn't really feeling with these new line combinations is that it knocked Cooley from the third line down to the fourth line. And as we mentioned, both Cooley and Offman, you know, during the preseason, we were talking about if one or both of these guys can make the team, they can both play a fourth line style if need be. Um, but Cooley has been one of the Ranger better depth forwards. So I didn't really like the idea of kind of demoting him. I mean, it's not really a demotion. Obviously, you know, there's moving parts here and guys have to move up and down the lineup. But still, he went from the third line down to the fourth line. Um, but I think what this lineup allowed the Rangers to do, um, among other things, is it kept Brian Othman at his natural position of left wing. That's the position he's played the most in his life. Uh, he was drafted as a left winger. He's been playing left wing for the Wolfpack. He's played some right wing here and there. Um, you know, throughout his hockey career, but for the most part, a left winger. So 
lining up like this keeps Hoffman or gets Hoffman into the top nine, and it also allows him to play on his natural left wing. It's also worth pointing out that there wasn't like a major difference in terms of time on the ice, because sometimes we all get caught up on this, you know, who's on the third line and who's on the fourth line and why is this guy over here and why is this guy there? But when you look at the Ranger six bottom six forwards uh, for this night, uh, the time on the ice was distributed pretty evenly uh, among the bottom six forwards. Barclay Goodrow had the most ice time with 1338. Brodzinski had the least with 920. But other than Brodzinski, everybody else, every other Ranger forward, all these bottom sixers, they had at least 11 minutes. Brandon Othman ended up with 1226. That was the third fewest among Ranger forwards. Only Cooley and Brodzinski had less time. Uh, but that's not surprising. Obviously, it's his debut. Bring him along gradually. And I think the Rangers did that. And Othman, for the most part, you know, showed very well for himself in this game. Got his first shift about a minute, 45 seconds in. And I wouldn't say that he came super close to scoring here, but he was in position. There was a shot from the blue line, and he was kind of on the other side of the net there, possibly looking for a rebound. If the puck had bounced off the goalie a little bit differently, I think Offen might have had a chance at this. But um, as it was, you know, Offen a solid first shift. He played with energy pretty much the entire night. Looked like he belonged. And after that first shift, uh, Bonino and assistant coach Nick Muse, apparently they both gave him a pat on the back on the, uh, the bench there. And Offen uh, kind of had a big exhale after that. It's kind of like, okay, let's go. Um, Johnny Brodzinski and Brian Offman are apparently pretty close. Uh, sounds like uh, Brodzinski kind of took Offman under his wing a little bit with the Wolf Pack. And um, Brodzinski mentioned that Offman had been nervous uh, since he arrived. And um, this, this is coming from Sam and Joe, by the way. They also mentioned that Will Cooley was talking about the situation. And you, know, you just need a couple of shifts. And then uh, you just settle down and basically start worrying uh, about playing hockey. But it sounds like Cooley and Offman are pretty tight as well. You know, they've crossed paths in the past as well. And obviously, uh, the two young guns as far as the New York Ranger forwards are concerned. Um, there was another play in the first period where Keandre Miller left the puck for Offen behind the net, and Offen brought it to the side of the net, tried to shoot from a sharp angle there, couldn't quite bury it. A decent chance again, though, for Offen, you know, fairly early in this game. Uh, you also had then Brodzinski uh, passing to his right to Offen in the right circle, uh, shot by Offen, save was made. Uh, but again, some good opportunities, and nice to see Offen, who's known as a sniper, uh, not being afraid to do just that. Um, just because he's on a new team at a new level. And then the second period, uh, Offman, probably his biggest hit of the night. He had three hits, but uh, he put his guy into the boards um, in the, uh, I want to say, the attacking zone for the Rangers. Um, it was on the side of the ice with uh, where the benches are, but it was uh, in one zone or the other. But either way, Offman with a solid hit there. Got a good reaction from the crowd. I mean, the crowd's always going to react to a good hit, but I think they were aware, okay, that's Brian Offman. That's the new guy. That's the prospect. I'm sure... Um, I was certainly not the only Ranger fan kind of tracking Brandon Offman throughout this game. So that was cool to see him uh, lay in a big hit there, which, I mean, he's just as well known for that as he is uh, for his offensive prowess. So good stuff there. And then uh, the same shift, two excellent scoring chances for Offman came very close in both times. Uh, he actually went between the legs to make a pass to Brodzinski and kind of lead him into the attacking zone. And then puck came back out, but Offman actually stole the puck in the neutral zone, uh, got it to Brodzinski, uh, Brodzinski had a good look along the boards, uh, pass behind the net to Bonino. Bonino with a one-touch pass in front to Brian Offen. The save was made, um, but a good scoring opportunity there for Offen. The Rangers kept it in the attacking zone, and then you had uh, Bonino tried to go around behind the net with, with a wraparound and just could not execute, and Offen nearly buried the rebound. So Bonino kind of circled around behind the net, swung it in front, tried to go to the far side of the net with it. The goalie, Mrazek, got a piece of it with his pad, and Offen was there crashing the net. And Offen kind of got a little bit handcuffed here. Puck was kind of in a weird spot for him where I don't think he really knew whether to go forehand or backhand. Tried to backhand it in, just couldn't quite do it. But again, two really good scoring chances for Brandon Offen on the same shift here. And as far as his stats, I mean, we've gone over a couple of them here, but once again, 12 minutes, 26 seconds of ice time, no points, even plus minus, five shots on goal, three hits. He actually tied for... Uh, first on the team on the night with Will Cooley for three hits apiece. Um, and his five shots on goal were the second most all-time by New York Ranger in their debut. And the most important stat here, he got the Broadway hat. The Rangers posted a video uh, on their social media accounts on Twitter of Artemi Panarin giving the Broadway hat to Brodz or yeah, to Brodzinski. He gave it to Offman. Um, Brodzinski was actually in the video. But it's funny because Panarin, uh, he said something to Truba. He said, great pass, Trubes, but I got to give it to Otter. And, um, you know, he did. He gave it to Brian Offen. 
couple of the guys were young for often to make a speech and uh, he kind of kept it short and sweet, but he just said great two points and I'll see you on the plane. So um, yeah, couldn't have gone a whole lot better for Brent often. I mean, in theory, yeah. I mean, Derek Stepan in his NHL debut had a hat trick, but I mean, you're not going to see debuts like that very often in terms of just playing good, solid hockey, looking comfortable, looking like you belong and looking dangerous and looking like you can add um, an element of, you know, shooting to this team because there's a lot of guys that are kind of facilitators. If you want to add Brian Hoffman as a sniper, that can really help this team. I mean, it went great. I mean, there, there's really not a whole lot you can nitpick in terms of anything uh, that often didn't do so well in this game. So uh, very, very nice debut for Brian Hoffman. Uh, we're also going to talk in a little bit here, actually right now, pretty much, um, about why Brian Hoffman should be on the Rangers to stay. I'm going to give my opinion on that. And we're also going to talk about something interesting that Peter Laviolette did uh, with Brian Hoffman toward the end of this game. And we're going to get to all that good stuff in just a second. But first, definitely want to let everybody know that today's episode of Locked on New York Rangers is brought to you by Sleeper. It's almost the halfway point of the season. Rangers are off to an awesome start. Regardless of where the Rangers are in the standings, though, I want to remind you that you could win big by playing daily fantasy hockey on Sleeper, the official daily fantasy app of the Locked on NHL Network. Sleeper is our number one choice for daily fantasy sports, and especially daily fantasy hockey. Because with Sleeper, you can win 100 times your cash in daily fantasy hockey contests. All you have to do is pick whether studs like Panarin or maybe Offman or Mika or Kreider will record more or less than their sleeper projections for things like goals, assists, saves, plus, minus, and more in a given game. To win 100 times your bet on sleeper, you need to correctly predict the outcome of eight player stats. You heard me, Ranger fans. You can win 100 times your money playing daily fantasy hockey with sleeper. So start paying attention and nail your picks so you can start winning big. Use promo code Locked on NHL and you will get up to a $100 match on your first deposit. Terms and conditions apply. That's code Locked on NHL. See Sleeper's terms of use for details and locational availability. All right, we just want to thank you guys, as always, for making Locked on New York Rangers your first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms, including... All right, let's go ahead and keep everything rolling here. I want to talk about uh, why I think that uh, there needs to be some serious consideration given to pot potentially having Brian Oppen just stay with the Rangers. And, you know, it's something that I would imagine is probably at least on the table here. And I don't want us to get too far ahead of ourselves here. It is one game, but Oppen looked good, and he looked more dangerous than basically anybody in the bottom six has looked pretty much all season. I mean, obviously Jimmy VZ got hot for a while there, and I still think Jimmy VZ, depending on what happens with top line right wing, and if Wheeler continues to play well or not, I think if you're still looking for some kind of a solution there, that maybe Jimmy VZ at one time or another uh, might eventually, or at least should eventually get some consideration for that spot. Uh, as it is right now, though, he's doing a nice job in the bottom six, just plays a gritty brand of hockey, scoring more goals than we thought he was going to score, and actually added another goal in this game. And of course, you know, Will Cooley in the bottom six has looked good this season. Uh, he's been uh, kind of brought along at a good pace here, you know, playing on the third line mostly, very physical player. And uh, as I mentioned, a recent episode has a shot at 20 goals. I don't know that it'll get there, but uh, the possibility definitely exists. Uh, but then you look at some of the other Ranger bottom six forwards, and I'm not bad talking any of these people. I think, honestly, I've stood up for the Ranger bottom six probably as much or more as anybody else, uh, like on Ranger Twitter or, you know, any, anything like that. Um, I've mostly complimented them because I think they all – uh, play hard. I think there's some grit to all their games. A lot of good penalty killers in there. A lot of good defensive forwards in there. A lot of guys that will happily uh, block a slap shot with any part of their body. So, um, you know, props to those guys for doing the little things to help the Rangers win. But facts are facts. You look at this four, these four players here. Bonino, Brodzinski, Goodrow, Pitlick. And I know Brodzinski hasn't been here all year. I know Pitlick at times has been a healthy stretch, but still, you combine all four of those players, uh, they have a grand total. The four of them have four goals. All four of them have exactly one. So uh, at least all of them are on the scoreboard here. But, um, you know, that's just not enough. And I've kind of been of the mindset because, you know, a lot of Ranger fans have been saying lately, oh my God, there's, there's no offense from the fourth line and uh, they'll never score. And it's kind of like for me, um, when I when I look at the fourth line, whether it's this year or any other year, it's kind of like, you know, I think eventually they'll probably get a goal or two here or there. I mean, it's one of those things where I'm not expecting offense night in and night out. I think eventually, though, you think something's eventually going to happen. And thus far, it just hasn't. We haven't really seen any kind of offense uh, from those players out of the bottom six, uh, mostly in general. And I just have to wonder kind of out loud here, how many defense only forwards do you need? And notice I did not say defense first forwards. 
because a lot of these players are exactly that. These are defense only forwards in a lot of situations here. And again, I know that they're gritty players. I know they'll block shots. I know some of them play the penalty kill and everything. But 5v5, there's just not a whole lot of uh, of hope that these guys are going to really do anything offensively. And, you know, Tyler Pitlick, he's another one, you know, in that whole group there. I, I feel bad that he got injured. But, you know, if he comes back and maybe he's the odd man out instead of Brent Offen, maybe Brent Offen takes Tyler Pitlick's spot. I mean, whatever you might give up from going from Pitlick to Offman, maybe defensively, um, is it really worth keeping Brandon Offman out of the lineup for all the other things that he could do, all the offense that he could potentially provide? I'm going to say probably not here. And, you know, we could find we could find reasons to send Brandon Offman back down to the AHL. And obviously, you know, we've talked about this before on this podcast. The Rangers themselves, it sounded like they were kind of leaning toward keeping Offman in the AHL this year. And obviously, They've uh, changed their mind there, at least in the short term. Um, But yeah, you could find reasons to send him back down. You know, he's young. Uh, You could think that, well, the Rangers are in a cup race here, and he's very inexperienced, and they need people that have uh, competed at the NHL level. Uh, You could say something. I mentioned this a second ago that uh, Brandon Offman's defense needs a little bit of work because that was kind of the, uh, the scouting report out on him is that that's one of the reasons why he might not be NHL ready yet is that his defense just isn't there. But again, I will mention what I mentioned just a minute ago here. How many defense-only forwards do you need? Maybe it's worth it to give up just that little iota of defense to bring in a guy who can really, really help you offensively and really might be able to solve one of this team's biggest issues, one of this team's only issues, and that's the lack of secondary scoring. Brandon Hoffman, he might already be there. He might already be that guy. He doesn't have to come up and be a point-per-game player. He just has to be somebody that does all the little things right like he did in this game and chip in offensively, at least from time to time. That's all they really need out of Brandon Hoffman. If he does more than that, if he forces his way into the top six at some point, that's awesome. But if he comes up and he's just a guy that scores you know, every now and then, um, he kind of produces points at a half point per game or even a third point per game kind of a pace. That's still a heck of a lot more than what we're getting from a lot of the uh, the other Ranger fours in the bottom six right now. So yeah, maybe he is, uh, and I wouldn't even say a liability defensively because I haven't seen any evidence of that. I didn't see any in this game. Um, but if he's maybe a little bit of a step back defensively from some of the other Ranger bottom six fours, fine. You know what? There's enough guys that can play good defense. There's enough guys that can kill penalties. There's enough guys. The Rangers overall are a good defensive team. I don't think often being in there for Tyler Pitlick is going to cause this team to unravel uh, defensively. So that's not a good enough reason either as far as like his defense needs work to not um, not keep him at the NHL level. Uh, you could also say something along the lines of like, well, you know, we don't want to um, upset the apple cart. We want the Rangers to stick with the same roster that they've been going with all season, but everybody's always looking to improve. Every team in cup contention is looking to call up that prospect or make that trade for this other team, bring in that rental player that could make the difference for a stretch run and ultimately a playoff run. Um, so I don't think that's a good enough reason either. You could say that maybe like if he struggles, if often struggles, it could hurt his confidence a little bit. Okay, fine, maybe, but I mean, you know what? Cross that bridge when you get to it. If the Raiders leave Offman up for a while and he is struggling and it does look like his head is spinning a little bit and you start to realize like, okay, this kid might need a little bit more seasoning, then okay, by all means at that point, send him down. But, you know, if he plays like he did in this last one, I don't think that's going to be the case at all. Um, You know, there could be a situation here where they kind of do with Offman what they did with Will Cooley. Um, If you guys remember last year, Will Cooley was up, but it was only for four games. I think that was kind of the idea. I I don't think they ever intended to have Cooley on the Rangers long-term. Just wanted to get him a little bit of experience at the NHL level. They could end up doing that with Offman too. But again, if Offman plays well and he's an upgrade on whoever the odd man out of the Rangers lineup would be, and right now that would be Pitlick because he's injured, it would also be Pitlick even if he was healthy. But uh, regardless, you know, if he provides an upgrade on that player, then there's no real reason uh, to not allow him to stay in the NHL and uh, claim that spot. These positions, these these roster spots, they should always be up for grabs. There should always be ongoing competition in one way or another. So, yeah, the, Brent Offen should be no different. If he's ready to go, then he's ready to go, and there's no reason to send him back down. And what about the reasons for keeping him? You know, huge prospect. He has excelled on every team he's ever played on, at every level he's ever played on. He has produced points at every level of hockey. And I know the NHL, there's nothing like it. Uh, The AHL is not the same thing. The OHL is not the same thing. Fine. Even so, this guy puts up a ridiculous amount of, uh, you know, points at other levels of hockey. And as we mentioned a second ago, one of the Rangers' biggest issues and only issues is the scoring depth or lack thereof. And again, Offman uh, could 
end up helping them in that area. And Offman, honestly, and I thought about this going into this game because I'm trying to think in my head, okay, Offman got called up. Where is he going to play? Who are going to be his line mates? And there was that little part of me that said, you know, bleep it. Just throw him out there with Mika and Kreider on their right wing and just see how it goes. You know, just hit the ground running. Don't give him any time to think about it. Just you're out there with Mika and Kreider. Go, go, go. Um, once I thought about it a little more and kind of, uh, you know, thought about it rationally, because you hear about the prospect getting called up and, yeah, we all get excited, right? We're all fans. Um, but then I thought like, okay, you know what? Start him on the third line. He can always work his way up. It's possible that, you know, we've been talking about the revolving door that the Rangers have had. I mean, really at right wing in general, and really not just this year, but for the last couple of years, but specifically this year and specifically the top line right wing spot. That's where kind of the revolving door has been. And you've had mixed results from a couple of different players. And Blake Wheeler has played better recently, but this could be your solution right here. They might not even need to trade for a right winger. And we thought for a while, or at least I did, that that was the biggest weakness. And recently, I've kind of been thinking that maybe center would be the biggest weakness, especially if Heedle doesn't come back. So if you promote Brian Hoffman here, and he excels, and he eventually uh, does so well that Laviolette decides to move him up the lineup, and he puts him out there on the top line with Mika and Kreider, then you now can focus your uh, your trade deadline on acquiring that center because you've already solved your right wing problem. If Brian Hoffman you know, pans out and plays well for the Rangers, and again, don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves. It is only one game, but still, it was very, very positive. And we've been looking kind of outside the box. And could they trade for this guy or that guy? Could they bring Vladimir Tarasenko back? Could they go out and get uh, this guy or that guy over there? Um, you know what? This might be the solution right here. It might be Brian Offen. It might be his time. And the other thing I wanted to mention here on the subject of Offen playing right wing is that at the end of this game, uh, Laviolette did something interesting. So Blake Wheeler got into a fight in this game with Jared Tenorti, you know, New York Ranger legend, Jared Tenorti. Um, I, I'm pretty sure his jersey is going to go into the rafters when he hangs up his skates, but we'll cross that bridge on another day. But the bottom line, Wheeler was basically attacked by Tenorti, gets into a fight with him, five-minute major. So while this was happening, this is the third period, the Rangers were up by three goals. It was four to one. And Laviolette did just what I was just talking about. He put Brandon Offman on the top line right wing, with Mika Zibanejad and with Chris Kreider. And when you consider the situation, the game, and everything that was happening here, it really made all the sense in the world. Uh, for starters, again, there was that part of me that wanted to see him out there to begin the game. Um, but in this situation here, you're the Rangers. You're playing a bad opponent. I mean, let's just call it what it is. The Blackhawks are not a good team. Uh, you're up by three goals. It's the third period. You're in total control of this game. The Blackhawks, I mean, did they have a single good scoring chance in the entire third period? I'm not so sure that they did. Um, so you've got all that, and maybe you'd like to reward Offman for playing a good game so far, build his confidence a little bit, and your normal top-line right winger is in the penalty box for five minutes after the fight. So Wheeler's out of the equation anyway, so why not give Offman uh, a chance with two of the Ranger top fours? And that's exactly what Laviolette did. Um, it also allows Offman to play the right wing and kind of show what he can do there, and uh, Laviolette and the coaching staff can get a first-hand look at how Offman looks uh, playing on his uh, his off wing. Um, the, the Rangers did that. They gave him the chance. And Offman uh, looked just fine out there with Mika and with Kreider. I mean, there wasn't too much that, that really stood out, um, you know, tremendously. But uh, he looked like he belonged. Again, he looked comfortable there. Uh, I do believe he uh, had a decent scoring opportunity. Yeah, so he got a pass in the high slot and took a shot, and it was blocked. Um, but then he also recovered the puck on the same shift, moved it back to the defenseman, to keep the offensive zone possession alive. This happened while he was out there with Mika and with Kreider. So it was awesome that he got that opportunity. And again, if he sticks with the Rangers, I think he's still going to be in the bottom six initially. But honestly, give it some time. He might be your top line right winger by the time this team is heading into the playoffs. And again, don't want to get too far out of ourselves. The possibility is certainly on the table, though. Uh, we're going to keep everything rolling in just a second. There was other things going on in this game other than often making his debut. Uh, perhaps nothing quite as exciting, but uh, the Rangers took care of business against a Blackhawks team that they should beat. They ultimately did beat. And we're going to talk about some of the other highlights from this game in just a second here. First, though, we definitely want to let everybody know that today's episode of Locked On New York Rangers is brought to you by FanDuel. The NFL regular season is wrapping up, but there's still time to get in on the action with FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Right now, new customers can get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's 150 bucks in bonus bets, win or lose. The app is so easy to use, and there are so many different ways to bet, like live, same-game parlays, find bets in the new Explore tab, 
make a parlay in the Parlay Hub, the best way to find popular parlays, and much, much more. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet a layup. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. All right, so a couple other uh, notes from this game other than the uh, excitement of Brandon Offman obviously making his debut. I thought, again, nice to see Igor Shesterkin bounce back. He had a stretch of five outstanding games in a row, obviously had a little bit of a clunker against the Canes, although so too did basically the entire Ranger team. And Igor is very strong in this one. Again, not the uh, most potent offense in the league, the Blackhawks, but nevertheless, uh, Igor making the saves when he had to, stop 22 of 23 shots. Uh, there was also a situation where uh, Connor Bedard basically fell on top of Igor. And, um, you know, the Rangers actually kind of cut him a break here. Gustafson and Lafreniere were nearby. Um, but it was pretty obvious that it was an accident. It was actually a smart play by them not to really go after him because, you know, your, your goalie's down. He's got somebody on top of him. I think the last thing you want to do is kind of like jump on top and, you know, potentially make it even worse. So kudos to the two of them for uh, kind of showing some restraint there and understanding the situation. Uh, the first goal that was scored in this game, we'll just call this Trocek doing Trocek things. He's just been awesome for the Rangers this season. But yeah, the Blackhawks, they've got the puck in the Rangers zone. Uh, more specifically, Connor Bedard has the puck in the Rangers zone. Trocek approaches him near the blue line and basically just shoves him down to the ice, skates away with the puck, goes to the neutral zone, leads Lafreniere up the right side with a pass. And then Lafreniere, a great pass of his own, threw some traffic over to Artemi Panarin on the other side of the net. Uh, Panarin immediately shoots and scores. Rangers go up one to nothing. And I thought about this after it happened. You know, we've talked about the Panarin bump on here and how, you know, everybody Panarin plays with, whether it's a big prospect, you know, a fellow superstar player, uh, somebody that is homegrown with the Rangers, somebody that's a veteran journeyman, whatever the case might be, you know, maybe somebody that should be in the bottom six. Uh, everybody that plays with Panarin gets a little bit of a bump when it comes to their offensive statistics. He's done that with everybody he's played with on the Rangers. But this Lafreniere, he is more important. It's more important Panarin does that with him than anybody else that, that he's ever played with because there's a lot of eggs in the Lafreniere basket. First overall pick, everybody thought he was like this, you know, phenomenal player coming up and, you know, flashes here and there. Um, but overall inconsistent his first couple seasons in the league, uh, but now getting a chance to play with Panarin and really taking advantage of it and really excelling and the latest player to benefit from that Panarin bump. But of all the players that Panarin has elevated, none more important for this Ranger, Ranger franchise than Alexi Lafreniere. So that was cool to see as well. We also had Chris Kreider scoring a controversial goal uh, to make the score two to nothing. So Raiders on the power play. Puck is loose in front. There's kind of a scramble. Kreider comes up and skates into the puck, hits it with his skate, and it goes into the net. It gets reviewed. It was initially ruled a goal, and the call on the ice stands. And I was kind of surprised. I mean, to begin with, I, I just thought that even taking the Rangers out of the equation, that this is the kind of goal that would get overturned. Um, the fact that it was also the Rangers made me sure that it would be overturned. Um, but it's weird because it certainly seemed for sure, like Cryer knew what he was doing here, and skated forward and purposely had his skate make contact with the puck, but he didn't really kick at it so much as he skated into it. And I'm not sure if that's really allowed or not. There's so much gray area with this rule. Now I know one thing you can do, you know, if the, it says like somebody else shoots the puck and the puck's going wide and you're Kreider, you can purposely put your skate up or put your skate in position to have the puck bounce off of your skate and into the net. That's legal. And that's a good goal. But as far as like purposely skating into the puck, like he did here, I don't know if that's allowed or not. Um, obviously, if there's a distinct kicking motion, it would not be allowed. He didn't really kick at it, though. Like, he just skated right into it. So I'm honestly not sure. I've never seen one quite like that. I'm not sure what the proper ruling should be. Maybe the idea there is that what I just said, there was no distinct kicking motion, and that's why the goal stood. Um, it's just going to be wonderful. Uh, and I've mentioned this in the past, but it's just going to be wonderful when a Stanley Cup playoff series uh, is determined, you know, game six or a game seven, possibly in overtime by one of these calls where nobody knows what a kick is. Nobody knows what the rule is. It goes to Toronto. It's determined by somebody who's not even in the arena and, you know, playoff series swings one way or another because of, you know, just a gray area. Nobody knows what's going on. Kind of a call such as this. And I just hope when that does happen, it doesn't involve the Rangers. I hope somebody else has to deal with that and uh, not the Rangers, but you know, Kreider, man, every time he scores, he's setting a new, personal record or he's saying another uh, landmark or it's a, you know, whatever season in a row that he's done this or that, or he's climbing an all-time list. So now with this goal, 
Nine seasons of 20 goals or more for Chris Kreider, including the last six in a row. Uh, tied with Jean Rattel now for the second most 20 goal seasons with the Rangers. Uh, of course, again, with nine. Uh, Rod Bear has 12. So that's even another record that Kreider could potentially uh, catch because Kreider's got three more years left on his contract after this one. He plays out the full contract. Um, he's got a chance if he gets 20 plus in all of them, he can tie Joe Bear there. Uh, he could even be back with the Rangers when his contract ends. You never know for sure. Uh, he's also now fourth alone in fourth all time in Ranger history, uh, in power play goals. So again, every time this guy scores a goal or gets a point, uh, feels like he's climbing another all time list. And a big congratulations to Kreider for the, uh, latest milestones here. Um, also want to just give the Rangers some props for their strong start to the third period. You know, for the first 40 minutes of this game, I really thought the Rangers clearly had the better play. There was a sequence in the second period that was not good at all, where the Rangers gave up a goal after a sloppy line change, took a penalty right after. Other than that, though, I thought the Rangers dominated pretty much for the first 40 minutes. But, you know, you go into the third period, it's like, oh, man, you know, we're still only up by one goal. You know, what's going on here? But the Rangers, um, they really took care of business. They scored two goals in the first two minutes and 41 seconds of the third period to basically just kind of, uh, you know, make sure they were on their way to this win. You had Shruba shooting from along the boards. He got to a loose puck, just put it at the net, and it went in three to one. And then uh, just a minute and 10 seconds after this, uh, the Rangers... You know, good defensive zone, good defensive play in the neutral zone by Braden Schneider. He came up, stole the puck, uh, sent it on its way to Will Cooley. Cooley made a nifty little move around a defender in the neutral zone, got over the blue line, passed to his left to Jimmy Vesey, and VC scored. So again, Rangers two goals in one minute and 10 seconds. And I've talked about the Rangers struggling in the shift that follows a goal, but they've been better recently. They've even a couple of times responded to a goal with another goal, not too long after that, as they did here. And I mentioned this recently too, but... You know, that whole thing where they struggle on the shift that follows a goal, there's no real tangible reason for it. It's just a lack of focus or something along those lines. The Rangers at any minute can kind of flip a switch there and just say, okay, let's make sure we're playing after, you know, the goal is scored the way that we're playing the rest of this game. And they can very easily turn a weakness into a strength. Now, imagine if the Rangers were to do that. That would really be something to see. And there's some evidence recently uh, that that could indeed be happening. The other thing I wanted to mention here uh, as we close out today's episode is we had this uh, situation in the third period where, uh, again, Ranger legend Jared Tenorti attacks Blake Wheeler for what I, as far as I could tell, was for absolutely no reason. Uh, Wheeler was kind of down on one knee, and Tenorti's kind of shoving him, and then he shoves him again, he shoves him again. Wheeler, you know, starts to stand up at that point, and Tenorti knocks him down onto his back. So Wheeler gets up, throws a punch at Tenorti, and hits him. Uh, they drop the gloves. Tenorti did win this fight, though Wheeler did uh, land a couple of punches here. And I like that Wheeler stood up for himself here. And I have no idea what Tenorti's problem here was. Maybe just frustration. I mean, the Blackhawks lose a lot. So there's that. Um, obviously, like we just mentioned, this is a close game going into the third period. And all of a sudden, it was not a close game. So it could be mounting frustration there. I don't know what the problem was. Uh, it's a good thing Tenorti can fight because he can't really do much else. But um, yeah, good to see Wheeler stand up for himself. And uh, the blessing in disguise there was that it gave Hoffman a little bit of a chance to play with Mika Zibanejad and Chris Kreider, and I thought that was cool. A couple of closing notes here. Uh, Igor Shosturkin is the Rangers All-Star. We're going to talk more about the All-Star selection process in a uh, future episode, but it should have been Panarin. What they do is they pick one All-Star from all 32 teams, and that's a ridiculous way to do it, by the way. And again, we'll talk about this in more detail in a future episode. Uh, but the Ranger representative, if they're going to use this format, Ranger representative uh, should have been Artemi Panarin. And again, we'll discuss that more in the future. Um, and then the other little bit of news here, Artemi Nisimov, I mentioned now 35 years old, signed to a PTO with the Hartford Wolfpack, made his Wolfpack debut, and scored the game-winning goal of their 3-2 victory. So uh, big congratulations to former Ranger uh, Artemi Nisimov. And maybe... Uh, the signing of him was no coincidence. Maybe they knew that they were about to promote Brian Hoffman, and we got to bring somebody in. We want a, a veteran with this team. Um, we need somebody that can do a little bit of scoring, and uh, Anisimov was their guy. So he's there, and a uh, good debut for our time, Anisimov. I mean, I didn't see the whole game. Don't know how he played other than that, but he game winning goal uh, in your first game with the team. Uh, that's obviously a nice start. So, yeah, we'll call it there for today. Once again, if you guys would like to get in touch with this podcast, please send an email to lockedonnyrangers at gmail.com. Once again, that is locked on nyrangers at gmail.com. Definitely give us a follow on Twitter as well, at LO underscore NY underscore Rangers. Once again, that is at LO underscore NY underscore Rangers. And definitely subscribe to Locked On New York Rangers YouTube channel. Thanks again, guys. I will see you next time.